the, the perception, as you mentioned, is a little bit different maybe to, to people in the West of, of what Pakistan is like. But, but you, when, you, when you were younger, there were a lot of tourists and, and hiking and things yeah, like that. I, mean, I remember so, I remember in the, you know, in the trains, the, the people would go and you'd see these guys, uh, girls, men, women. They came there for the best weed and uh, <laughs> for, you know, the, the pot or marijuana or hashish. And they'd be, I, I've seen people just roaming around the streets, the kind of quasi hippies or leftovers of the hippie era. And I'm talking uh, late seventies, even, even in the eighties, you could see that. And um, now uh, it's changed a lot, but uh, it's, there was no violence. There was no issue. It was the most hospitable place in the whole world went there and People came, tourist, tourism was there, and um, exciting things happened. So, so maybe you can tell us, because I was reading in uh, the sort of excerpt of the book that you uh, gave us to read, you, you spoke a bit about the changes that happened, you know. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about those changes. Um, you know, they're quite radical. Yeah, and, you know, they can be summarized uh, to a very particular event when, uh, when the Russians invaded Afghanistan. Um, in late 70s, and I, I was young, too young to actually remember that, but uh, that had happened, and it was 78 or something like that. And uh, Iran had uh, the, the Khomeini revolution in, I think, 79, and the Iranian government, uh, the Shah of Iran, had toppled. So that, if you think about it, Pakistan on one side has Iran, and uh, another side it has um, Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Then it has a bit of... Uh, China, hmm. and then it has India, and uh, Uzbekistan and those Tajikistan, the Russian republics uh, the, at that time, the Soviet Empire. That they are also right there. So it's wow. strategically it's it's surrounded by these um, countries. So when in the uh, Russians invaded, there was this big the first war, the first uh, Afghan war was fought, and the Americans were trying to push back the communists from. Uh, that time from Afghanistan and that's when the Mujahideen and all those people were fighting and um, I remember that until that time we didn't see any violence but then suddenly when the huge refugee influx happened into Pakistan perhaps one of the world's largest refugee people left Afghanistan and came into Pakistan and they were kept in tents millions of people came mm -hmm. And the U.S. was involved in, in Rambo 2 is a movie that actually kind of is set in that time. Rambo 3, I think, where he goes to, to save somebody, some soldier or whatever. So this is that era. When the, so uh, that was a big change. And it, was a, it, it almost seems that those events happened completely randomly. That Russia invades Afghanistan, um, people get pushed out. America decides that we need to push Russia back and we need to arm the Afghans to fight against the Russians. Mm. And the Mujahideens come together. The Mujahideens end up, their children are born in Pakistan and those children are called the Taliban. Mm -hmm. So who, who wow. could have crafted this story? No Jeez. way. Uh, this the Talib means student. And mm -hmm. uh, so they lived in tents and camps provided by foreign aid. And uh, because there was nowhere to go and these amazing cricketers that you see from Afghanistan, if you go back to there, they literally learned cricket on the streets of Pakistan. Goodness. Yeah. Why is it that uh, uh, the largest uh, fund in the world, uh, BlackRock, Larry Fink writes a letter to shareholders that make sure that you invest in those companies which are actually trying to do something improve the lives of people. Today, yesterday, Jamie Dimon, the CEO of JP Morgan Chase, said exactly the same thing. Mm. And it is very, because there is no time left, we have finally come to that point in our world's journey that if we don't do something about it, this automation-driven um, success that will create relentless profit without using more people, more expenditure. Now these companies can grow even bigger. 
because they are so automated, so good, so efficient that, that uh, it, is, it is almost counterproductive for them if they don't do something to improve the flock. Like for instance, Amazon has half a million people and uh, half of them make less than $35,000 a year or $15 an hour. And they raised it from something to $15 an hour. Mm. Now, how can it be that half their workforce is slightly above poverty? Mm. This is not capitalism. It is tomfoolery. Mm. You are hurting yourself. You're, it's like a tree cutting its own roots. This creates a virtuous circle, which will, and there's so much data and, you know, conscious capitalism has produced it and every analysis now studies, research studies that those companies which are socially responsible and do the right thing are more profitable, long-term sustainable. Hmm. The, the whole food story, which was acquired by Amazon is amazing. The Patagonia story. Hmm. The, 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 the success of the guy who did Chobani yogurt, mm -hmm. fastest to grow to a billion dollars in like five years, this guy in America made this Greek yogurt and multi-billion dollar company. And uh, what did he do? He treats his employees as owners. He gave everyone, uh, I mean, this is a whole new paradigm, but it is the oldest paradigm. Yeah. Do not hurt people. Mm -hmm. Do not be aware of the unintended consequences. Yeah. Yeah. So true. I, I it's used, not yeah, science, hey? yeah, exactly. I used to, I used to be an investment banker and, you know, each quarter you would sit and you'd listen to the COOs and whatever, give you this amazing talk in the auditorium and blah, blah. And they, and every single time at this particular bank, the the guy that was at the the, the the helm, he would say, the most important thing about this business is our customers. And every time I would sit there and I'd go, bud, you've got it so wrong. The most important thing about this is your employees. Yep. And yeah, you know, it's so great that there's people like you that are, doing this and the guy Chobani that are that are changing that mindset and understanding who the important people are because that needs to change businesses need to need to really I mean, it's, it's necessary it is necessary uh, you know the, 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 it is necessary now uh, it, if we don't do that uh, we won't be able to I think there'll be so much so many people will be left behind that we will have to figure out what to do with those people. Because the fear is, and this is the sort of doomsday fear, but it could happen, that the people that will be left behind will be so far, their brains will evolve differently for the next hundred years. Because they will be so, uh, their children will go to different schools. Their anger will lead to all kinds. So there will be first time there will be a bifurcation in society and it would be irreversible. Hmm. Because if we don't do something about this inequality and things like that, we have to be sensitive to these things. You can't keep a you know, few hundred million people of the world left behind. It's dangerous, it's bad strategy. So, but tell me, around about 17, uh, your life uh, took a bit of an unexpected trajectory when you witnessed uh, something happen to your family sausage dog. Hey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, that was crazy, man. So, anyway, I, um, you're at, I was 17. So, basically, you're, in, you're at that phase of where you know, you have to decide what are you going to do for the rest of your life? <laughs> That's just the way it works, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So um, we'd laughed about this with one of our other guests, but um, marine biology was always one of the things on the cards, especially <laughs> living at the beach. Um, and uh, 
I wasn't really sure. I did love biology. I had always loved animals and what have you. So um, anyway, Jackie, our little sausage dog, was a little overweight, and uh, as they get sometimes, and her back started to like get sore, and she would she would her ears would be hanging, and her arch would uh, sorry her back would be arched, and she would just be visibly in pain, and uh, it was just horrible to witness. And we took her to the vet, right, uh, as one does, and the vet says, you know, I don't know what to do here. We can't sort this. There's not much we can do. Why don't you see the chiropractor? And we were both like, what? That's crazy. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> I didn't even really know what a chiropractor was at this stage. So um, my mother had seen a chiropractor and, and, and you know, loved this guy to bits. She'd help, he'd helped her a lot. And um, so we phoned the guy up, Robin Dugmore is his name. And, he's, and uh, he says, you know, a spine's a spine, nervous system's a nervous system. Bring the dog in, please. Uh, after, you know, after all my patients are gone, I'll, I'll just have a look for you. So we bring the dog in. Long story short, by this stage, Jackie was basically dragging her back legs. They weren't functioning properly because of the, you know, because of the, the pressure on the nerves from the, this bad back injury. And so anyway, he had her over the knee and he did this and that and did his thing. And basically, she walked out where she had basically dragged her legs in. And I saw this in front of my eyes and I was like, good Lord, you know, what just happened? You know, this is incredible. Wow. So that was, I was obviously in an quite impressionable at that stage and it blew me away. And so he gave me a book to read, um, which just blew my mind as well about chiropractic. Uh, and I, and then I just spent a few, a bit of time with him looking at what he did. And uh, I was just, I just loved it. I was just like, is this really your job? You know, this is great. Um, so I, I said, mom, you know, this is it. I'm moving to Joburg next year um, because my sister lived there to study chiropractic. And that was the sort of that beginning of that uh, whole trajectory, actually. Yeah. Wow, man. That's so cool. That is such a cool way to get into what you ultimately end up doing. Hey, and <laughs> yeah. maybe let's, let's just uh, talk a little bit about uh, Robin a little bit. Yeah. I to mention our Robin Dugmore. Um, it, you, you basically had one of your proudest moments uh, with him. And maybe you can just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, that was that was quite a proud moment. So anyway, Robin was the one of the nicest guys I've ever met. Genuinely, like just Eastern Cape guy, as uh, just salt of the earth. Uh, I literally I've never met someone as nice as him. So uh, and anyway, that was just a pretext to to the story. But he um, so he'd got me into chiropractic, and not long after that incident, he was actually diagnosed with a brain tumor, which was devastating, and. Uh, anyway, I went off to uni in Johannesburg, did my thing there. And I went and I always made a point of when I went back home, I'd try and visit him just to say hi. And I was in sixth year. I was just basically, I think I just finished or just before I'd finished, uh, studying. I, uh, um, I went to visit him and at this stage he was so ill with the brain tumor that he, he was very weak. And so he actually could only see two people a day, um, mm. which is not, is nothing, but he still kept doing it. Like he, even though he was so, he was like, I can only see two. And then he's, then he would be broken. He'd have to go lie down. Right. Mm. But he wanted to still do what he loved. Right. And that was super inspiring in and of itself. But anyway, I, I went to see him. Um, he's very weak. We, he was on the couch. He, and, he, and I said, you know, I just want to tell you, like, I'm finished my studies now. Um, and uh, I just want to, you know, spend some time to say thank you and how much you've mean, meant to me, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, yeah, I always get a little bit emotional just thinking about it. So, um, anyway, he's like, great, while you're here, please, won't you just check my spine, you know? And um, so I'm like, oh, my God, this, I was nervous. You know, this is full circle time, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I got to, I got to adjust him and, and, uh, you know, he gave me a hug and he's like, this is great. And yeah, that was the, the last time I got to see him. So it's quite sad. Yeah. Um, flip, man. That's touching, but yeah. that's really touching. Yeah. And, um, yeah, well done for, for keeping in touch with a guy like that, you know, because it says a lot about you as a person, but it says, it just says so much about you, you know, and that's the, that's the Craig 
I flip it. No, you know what I mean? He, he cares deeply about people and, Thanks, and that's buddy. testament to, you know, to who you are. Like this, this started at such a young age, you know, so flipping really Thanks, touching buddy. story, man. Thanks for sharing Thanks, that. Sure. But yeah, um, cool, one of the people that's also had a huge influence in your life, as well as I guess I started the podcast was your grandfather. So mm. tell me a little bit about your relationship with him and, you know, who he was and why you sort of cherished him so much. Cool. And yeah, it's a cool question. Um, yeah, I know like certainly you've told me so about your grandfather and I, I can't wait to hear more. Um, and I had a good relationship. I actually lived, we actually lived next door to my grandparents for a long time, um, which is a great, uh, well, for me as a youngster, it was great. Um, my grandmother, uh, Granny uh, Doreen, was her name as she was just this quintessential um granny i don't know like flipping amazing at like crossword puzzles uh she was like this trivial pursuit genius and she would make these amazing tapestries with one which is hanging in my house right now um and cooked like a machine like just the yummiest stuff and so they said she was that that woman you know and just loving like just this most loving person and i have real fond memories of her um and and just these great conversations we'd have um and she'd always be caring and and, and it's great to think of actually now so i'm just you know just think having those feelings um come back is nice you know yeah um and and my grandfather was this epic guy man he, he was just like this ultimate storyteller um, and, uh, he was, he was mischievous and, uh, had the sense of humor as well, um, like crazy, but in a sort of a dry way. So for example, the one day, <laughs> uh, the one day he, um, he used to tease my grandmother. Like he'd, he'd say like all the time, like, where's my tea, Doreen? Oh, I'm not, you know, I can't handle it. Where's, Cause they'd have tea and you know how it goes and back in the day. <laughs> so anyway, one, <laughs> so one day he's flipping, um, he actually, cause he was a tinkerer, as I mentioned, he was always busy with stuff. So he fell off the ladder and he's probably, I don't know how old he was, maybe flipping, um, 80 or so. He fell off the ladder, right. Um, painting the, the gutters and he crawls in to the kitchen, uh, <laughs> on on all fours <laughs> and my, my my grandmother looks at him and says yes 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 ken i'll make your tea now <laughs> uh, meanwhile he had actually fallen but anyway it was uh, classic and you know that was the kind of thing he would do you know um but epic guy so we, we, he was like he would take me fishing like that was my thing man i used to love going with him fishing and we'd go and stand in his backyard and he'd teach me how to like, we'd cast with just a sinker on and we'd just, you know, cast the sinker in the backyard. Um, he, he was, um, he was in the second world war. He was in North Africa and he used, he could speak, um, and I've just forgotten the, the language um, that he, that he learned, um, but he could speak quite a lot of it. Um, one of the North African languages. Swahili there. or something like Swahili, that. Swahili. That's right. So yeah. yes, Swahili. And, um, so he, um, he actually used to teach people how to drive the, the vehicles and stuff, the army vehicles and all that. So we, all the grandchildren flip and you learn to drive really young wow. um, in the backyard because he was just like, you got to learn. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> yeah, so, so we'd go fishing and, and we'd come back and then grand would make like a, um, this amazing, we'd catch whatever we'd caught we'd she would make this battered fish for us and we'd sit there together just, you know, like the three of us and, uh, um, and then after the lunch or whatever, we had, he would have a, a moment. We, we have to learn how to waltz. So he taught all of us grandkids how to waltz. So, and uh, he always used to sing. Um, and people listening should listen to the song. Go Google it. It's called Tennessee Waltz. And um, it's a great song, actually. Uh, and I still, like, if I think of my grandfather, he, uh, I think of that song always, you know, because he would always hum. He would hum or sing that song, like, you know, we'd be walking through the, the house or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. I mean, I totally agree with you. And, but it also, it also is testament to your um, willingness to get involved, get stuck in and, and show up, you know, and, and that's clearly a trait that you've had for a long time. And I think it's always a two way street, isn't it? But we are lucky. And I think people are willing to, to allow, 
you know, allow you into that inner circle, which is special, especially with, like you were saying with that Mr. Kiddo, you know, like must've been felt pretty privileged to be in that space with him. But how, how important are, or is having a role model and mentors in your opinion? I think it's huge. I think, I, yeah, I just think it's massive and, and not, not that you know it at the time when you're younger, um, but you do have people that are going to really shape your future and see the good in you and want to help you out. And I, I think for me, I know for me in particular, like if I look back on my life, I've had so many good mentors. Um, and I don't know if it's because for some reason I was seeking them and that we found each other somehow, but I just feel super fortunate that I've had it. But, but also what I've become conscious of is as an older adult now is to carry on seeking these people uh, because it doesn't matter what level you are at in your life. If you're the president of a country or whatever, there's always going to be somebody who inspires you and who you look up to. And it's important to follow these people because they're going to, they're going to do things that you're going to want to do and push you. And, and, you know, they might be just role models. And so, so basically you just look up to them and don't necessarily have like a direct relationship with them. But then from the mentor side of things, I think it's important to actually go and seek these people and ask them. I even, I even remember like quite a few times um, in my, my banking career and um, also like on, from a social side of things, I, I've actually asked people if they would mentor me. I'm like, you know, do you mind mentoring me? Because I really like, I really connect with you and um, I know that you'll be able to teach me sort of things. And every single person generally says yes. And I think it's, it's a human thing. Like humans, no matter what you might see in the news and all these sort of things, we, we're actually really are wired to help each other. Mm -hmm. And and that's actually what we are about. Like, you know, people love to help each other out. And, um, and if you ask somebody to, to mentor you and to guide you, I can promise you that probably 95% of the time they'll go, yeah, yes, of course. I'd, I'd be proud to, I'd, I'd love mm. to help you out. No, it's brilliant. Like, uh, whenever I hear you talking, uh, talk about banking it, uh, yeah, I know you, you still light up a little bit, you know, because you were there for so long. It's, it's just interesting to see, you know, it's still, shaped you as you said and uh and you've got so much knowledge about it i'm always like really enthralled when i'm listening to you and you talk about banking and you, you've told me so much about this machine you know that that's sometimes very slow moving and archaic but sometimes at the, the front edge of things it's just really really fascinating so um i'm sure there's a book in there one day about the banking industry but um, <laughs> you actually ended up um you left banking for a bit, then you went back and then you left permanently, ultimately. Um, and what, what sort of made you make the change and move away? And, and off the back of that, did you get a bit of pushback? Oh, interesting. Good question. So uh, I always, I don't know what it was, Craig, even though I loved it, there was always something else inside me. I just didn't feel like this is, was what Gareth had to offer the world. I was like, mm -hmm. You know, even though it taught me so much, um, I just felt like there was there was a void somewhere in my life, and I wasn't providing the value that I that I thought I I probably could. And the first, I remember we had worked on this crazy project. Like I've I've actually probably never really worked that hard in my life. Like it was it was obvious had just bought. Um, AB and Amro, and it was the biggest, and I think still is to this day, like the biggest financial merger in, in history. It was like $75 billion or pounds or something. It was huge. Wow. Right. So the project was long. It was like two, three year project to, to break this bank up into different things and put, put a new whole new bank together and blah, blah, blah. Um, and it kind of wore me out a little bit. Like the hours were incredible. It was really stressful. And and eventually I said to my boss, this lady, Nicole, also a great lady. And I said, uh, yeah, I, I really would like to take a sabbatical um, uh, once everything is finished. And she was like, cool, no worries. And um, 
I, I took a six and a half month sabbatical and it was like, that's when my eyes really got opened and I spent pretty much most of that time in South America and I met these like amazing people and it's, yeah, it, they were like doing all these cool things around the world, you know, like working from their laptops and, and doing things on the internet and stuff. And I was like, wow, I was like, wow, that's cause I was like, so like in the zone with just banking and stuff. I'd done it for like at that stage, probably, I don't know, 13 years or something like that. And I just thought that was it, you know, like this is the world, the world's all around that. And is, you know, that's where you want to be. If you want to be doing cool things is in like say banking, but then I met all these other people and then I started seeing more of the world. I'd already done a lot of traveling, you know, up until then, but I started seeing like really cool things. And I started remembering that I really love nature and being outside and I love being around people and meeting people. Like it was for me, that was like such a big part of it. Like it was about seeing all these people and making these new friendships. And I went back to, to banking, like you said. So, so that, that's what got it. That's what it got it going. And I was like, mm -hmm. But I was like, I'm going to go back to banking and now I'm like refreshed and energized and I'm going to hit it and I'm like, you know, going to make a name for myself and blah, blah. And then honestly, two weeks after I was back, I was like, this is not for me. And mm. I just knew it. I just like, I, I need to, I need to get out and do something else. And like you said, there was a, I, I did leave and I left, but I left and I had no plan really, but I just, I kind of thought I was going to do something and I did mm. some studying you know, like around app development. Cause I thought I was going to get into that cause that was the thing to do. And I just kind of messed around a little bit. And eventually I actually went back into banking for, for another three years. Um, wow. But I went back as a, as a consultant. So it, my setup was a little bit different. I wasn't like a permanent employee. Um, so I was able to go to like a few different places and I was able to save a bit more cash than normal. And, but at the same, but then I was like, okay, you have to have a plan. And for those three years I worked on, I worked on what I wanted to do. Um, and I thought I, I knew what I was going to do at the end of those three years. Um, but I'd been going on courses and meetups and whatever, and just kind of find reading books and listening to podcasts and all these sort of things. And, yeah. And then eventually after those, uh, those three years in it, I was like, okay, I know what I want to do. Or I thought I knew what I wanted to do. And, mm. but I, w and I, I wasn't enjoying the banking anymore. The, the, the banking had changed a, a fair bit. The industry became, I don't know, it just became weird. It was too regulated in terms of the only projects you were working on were, were, were regulatory, which, um, which were boring to be honest with you. And also mm -hmm. the banking industry was like shrinking and you, you never kind of felt safe in your environment uh, or your, your job was safe and everyone felt like that. No one was enjoying it. Like it wasn't fun to go into the bank anymore. And I like, I, I couldn't deal with that because my mindset had shifted. I couldn't deal with, mm. with like going into a place where it wasn't a growth mindset. Everybody was like hating it. And they wanted to do something else, something else. And, but most of them would never, cause they just talk about it. Mm. And I knew that I had to make a, a clean break from it so that I could get into a different headspace and go do what I actually wanted to do. And yeah. And that was the kind of start of all of that. That's awesome. And well done. It's a, it's a fascinating roller coaster, and, and it's amazing how, when you went back, how you, you just knew it just wasn't for you anymore, but it was actually so, so Bruce, um, according to your work, our early years are really important to the patterns basically that we create in our subconscious, uh, subconscious minds. Uh, and that basically can affect us later on in our lives. So what were the early years like for you growing up in, in New York? Well, uh, I grew up like now I find most families, a lot of dysfunction in the family of some kind or other. Uh, and you have to recognize that a child, uh, l let's understand why we have to do recording of uh, programs in the first seven years of life. Uh, uh, simply this, you buy a brand new computer and you open it up and you can turn it on. But if you don't have a program in there, then what good is it? You can't do anything with it. So first you have to install programs 
And then once you have the program, you can open a program and you can modify it and do whatever you want later on. But without any program, uh, there's nothing there. So uh, a child is born, the computer brain <laughs> is ready to work, uh, but it needs programs. And so the first seven years of our life, the brain is operating at a lower level than consciousness. In, in EEG, electroencephalograph terms, uh, the brain is operating at a vibrational frequency called theta. Theta is imagination. That's why kids below seven can mix the real world and the imaginary world. Uh, they're, they're on a broom. The mother says, give me the broom. The kid is saying, what broom? Because he's on a horse. And he's, you know, it's a real horse, but in that imagination. Or a tea party where they pour nothing into the cup and then they drink the nothing and say, oh, how wonderful the tea was. Uh, that is theta in operation. <laughs> But theta is also hypnosis. And so the significance is the last trimester of pregnancy through age seven, the brain is operating predominantly in theta, uh, theta being hypnosis, meaning what? A child through age seven is observing the world like a video camera. Everything they see, everything they hear is going into the uh, brain, not into the conscious mind because that's not functioning yet. It's being downloaded as programs in the subconscious mind. And this allows us to get off the ground. Uh, in other words, uh, if, if you say, how many rules does it take to be a functional member of a family or a community? My God, you'd have to have a book with how many different ways to respond to the world and all that. I said, how does an infant going to learn the rules so it can be a functional member? And the answer is, it doesn't have to read anything. All it has to do is see and hear. <laughs> and it will download all the programs. Uh, this course would have been great in college if we could have used that a lot. It would save a lot of time for us, but uh, first seven years, this is the principle, and so the significance is, where do we get the basic programs that we operate from? And the answer is, in the first seven years, we download these behaviors by observing other people copying theirs. Mm. So we look at our mother and our father, observe their behaviors, uh, and that becomes a program of how to be a mother and a father and a community and all that. Uh, and the problem, as we now know, is 70% or so of those programs are disempowering programs or beliefs that limit us or sabotage us. Uh, and, and they were put in because the people we copied them from didn't know any better anyway. So we, mm -hmm. if they had a dysfunction, then we copied that dysfunction. Uh, and it's this profound. Um, they looked at the fate of children adopted into families where there's cancer running in a family. And what did they find out is that the adopted child will end up with the same probability of getting, getting the family cancer uh, mm. as any of the natural siblings. But the program says, well, wait a minute. Uh, the adopted child came from totally different genetics. I go, yep. And why is this relevant? The cancer wasn't in the genes. The cancer was a, a, a problem of programs that were disempowering and sabotaging that we acquired by being in that family. So uh, there are two minds, so we need to get this right away fixed up, and that is there's a conscious mind, which is connected to our personal identity, and there's a subconscious mind, which by definition is just a record playback program. So the first seven years, I put programs in the subconscious mind. But after age seven, I get to use the conscious mind, which is the great creative mind. And I go, well, this is really great. I can then create what the hell I want. I don't have to follow the program. I go, yeah, that's true. Except uh, people don't realize this is that when we are thinking, the conscious mind lets go of the control of what's going on in the world because the thought is on the inside. So if I say, hey, tell, tell me what you're doing on uh, uh, Thursday at two o'clock, if, if you're looking around for the answer, I go, the answer's not outside, the answer is inside. What mm -hmm. am I doing on Thursday? So I'm thinking. Well, the problem is the moment I'm thinking, I'm not paying attention to what's going on. So it's interesting, if you're walking down the street and you have a thought, it doesn't mean you walk into a tree or walk off the sidewalk, or if you're driving the car and you're mm. thinking, it doesn't mean you crash your car. I go, well then, it, who's paying attention? If my conscious mind is going inwards, who's looking at the road? Mm. <laughs> and it turns out, subconscious is autopilot. So as we think, any job that's going on, any awareness that's necessary for our survival is now handled automatically, autopilot, subconscious. Well, that's where the programs that I got from other people are. So when I am thinking, I'm not playing my behavior that I want. 
when I'm thinking, I default to the program in the subconscious. Hmm. And I go, yeah, but that program wasn't my wishes and my desires for life. That was just copying my parents. So here's the, the big, most important lesson for everyone out there to listen at this moment. And that is this. We are only conscious about 5% of the day. 95% of the day, our conscious mind is busy thinking about what happened yesterday, what's going to happen in the future, what I need to do, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I go, yeah, but that means then 95% of the day, you're not operating from your creative conscious mind, which has your wishes and desires, health, happiness, relationships, great job. I say, oh, that's conscious wishes, mm. conscious desires. I go, but that's only 5% of the day. 95% of the day, we are operating from the programs. And, mm -hmm. and here's the part that really screws us up is because conscious mind is not observing as we're playing these subconscious programs, then if we have a negative program and we're expressing it, conscious mind doesn't see it. Conscious mm -hmm. mind's busy thinking. So whatever program is coming out 95% of the day, we don't really observe it. Uh, and uh, I could summarize it with a story I've said, I've given 30 years the same story because it <laughs> works. And that is this, uh, you have a friend, you know your friend's behavior very well, you happen to know your friend's parent. And one day you see your friend is expressing the same behavior as their parent. Uh, and then you, so you want to tell your friend, of course, you know, it's like, hey, Bill, you're just like your dad. <laughs> and then you back away from Bill because Bill goes totally ballistic, as Gareth <laughs> understands right now. Bill goes ballistic. How can you compare me to my dad? I'm nothing like my dad. And everyone laughs. Why? Because they've had this experience. And I say, two points, most profound story in the whole world, just from that. And point number one. Everyone else can see that Bill behaves like his dad. It's Bill who doesn't see it. I go, well, how does that happen? I go, because A, he downloaded that behavior in the first seven years of his life. B, 95% of the day he's thinking and automatically playing this behavior. And C, because his conscious mind's not watching the behavior, it's inside thinking, Bill doesn't even see the behavior. Mm. So, and, and so basically that's the point uh he he says i'm nothing like my dad and everyone else can see that he is mm. uh, uh and that's because we play these programs all day so that's profound point number one now everybody get ready sit down hold on because <laughs> profound point number two is this we are all bill <laughs> every <laughs> one of us is doing this all day long and so this is why problems arise in life because you have great wishes and desires and then you try to, you know, get to those wishes and desires. And then you find life is a struggle and it's hard and stuff doesn't come so easy and you sweat over making it happen. Uh, and then we, we look at the world and go, gosh, I wanted to be successful, but apparently the universe isn't helping me because I didn't make it. Hmm. Uh, and then I say, stop for a second. Guess what? The universe was going to give you everything you were thinking about. The unfortunate part is 95% of the day you were operating from a negative belief, just like Bill. And 95% of the day you are, uh, you know, if you don't have a program supporting what you want, the existing program will sabotage what you want. Mm -hmm. Is your, how do you and your wife support each other? Like, you know, does she, she's all involved in it too, or like, um, you know, well, you, yeah, she's the backbone of everything in my life. Mm. And she is the, the, she is the backbone of that because she's like a billion percent smarter than basically every human I know. So she runs all the, she does all the computer work, all the paperwork, all the design work and all the stuff. And I carry all the heavy things around and that's pretty much how that works. <laughs> um, we are committed to doing anything i don't care what it is we will do anything to help each other it just doesn't that's just how it is that's going to be and, and it now and i will say this that was before this mm. i don't think you're i don't think you should be married to each other if you won't do anything for each other if you won't bend over backwards to help each other if you won't do i have friends now who i've listened to their live story about their marriages or their marriages coming apart and because the man didn't love her. He's not, he, you don't love her if you're not willing to do anything for her. You just don't. That's just the truth. That's the hard way to look at it, but that's the truth. And we'll do absolutely anything. And sometimes within the situation we're in, that's 
trying to be okay for each other when one of us is out of our mind mm -hmm. and doing whatever it takes to help that. And some days that's, I need to carry all the boxes and some days that's you need to make sure I don't kill the neighbor. And some days that's, uh, I'll bring you home Reese's cups because that might make you happy. And some yeah. days that's, uh, you know, uh, and some days that's where you need to sit together and just be quiet and cry. And some days that's just, um, the reality is it, but part of the reason we're doing well with this is because we have a lifetime of practicing how we treat each other. Yeah. of practicing how we are with each other, of not being, no matter how crazy the moment is, not being vicious to each other, mm. not being, mm. no matter how bad, no matter how, and I'm, and okay, and I'm a, never toward her, but I'm a lit up human being. I'm, my emotions mm. are on, I, my whole life is, the volume is turned up to 10 all the time. <laughs> I've always been that way. That's the way I approach everything in lifting. That's the way I approach everything when I do everything. And that's the way I react emotionally to absolutely everything. And she's the calm, you know, like I said, keeps me from burning down the villages thing. But we have a lifetime of no matter what, you don't say vicious things to each other. You don't hurt each other. You don't do that. You take care of each other. You, I'll do anything, absolutely anything to make her okay, as, as okay as I can. And she do the same for me. And that's you, you, your, your relationship is not what it should be if that's not how it is between the both of you. And it has to be both ways. And yeah. if you don't practice that, you're, you, and, and people give up the hmm. possible fairy tale of what they could have. Yeah. I had a friend who said to me that recently, I never thought I'd, it, it was even possible to have the fairy tale of life of love of, of, I thought that was just all myth that nobody could ever have those relationships like that. You have to find the person who you truly do love that way, who you're meant to be with. But at the same time, you have to do it. You have to be what it takes to be with that to that person. And that means loving like you are like, there is no barrier. Like it is wide open. Like, and maybe it's just because that part of my head is broken and I have no governor. I have no, I have no breaks. <laughs> that kind of thing but if you don't passionately love that person like it is life and death you don't need to be with them and you don't need to and you need to create the life where even if a bomb goes off like it did in ours you can take care of each other and do and 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 i don't care i'm getting a sign from her right now she's just standing on the other side of the room writing notes to me telling me <laughs> 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 she wrote love you gomez because we have a joke about being the adams family couple of that about, <laughs> yeah, that's cool <laughs> about being morticia and gomez and we've been married 24 years and still kiss each other in public and make people feel uncomfortable and that kind of <laughs> <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't do that if you don't make that happen and, and here's the thing okay most people are living with these stupid barriers i, I i'm kind of bashful to hold her hand in public what's wrong with you yeah. Act like you own the place you are and do mm. what you want. Be what you want. Act like you actually have authority in your own life mm. and, and do it and make it. And, and you know what? Uh, well, I'm just not that interested. Well, freaking find the thing that makes you salivate passionately and live that way. Yeah. And even if you got to get a concussion to make it happen, I don't care what <laughs> happens. I, I, I just do it. Don't be, just, seriously, what are we doing that's wasting life? Why, why are we not living in a way that, why are you accepting less than that in a marriage, in your physical training, in your job, in your, in your moment to moment life? It, you have a short time on this planet and you can make it the most amazing story that anybody around you has ever heard. You can make it the most interesting thing because I'm sorry, if you're bored, it's your freaking fault. If, it's, if you're bored with life, you got to find better things to do. You got to yeah. make it happen. You, if you can't, you can't sit on the couch and complain about being bored. You, if you don't open the doors to living with each other like that, number one, you'll never survive a tragedy like with us, yeah. like the thing that happened to us. And number two, you, why would you go through life with someone you didn't love that way? And why would you go through someone? Why would you exist for 70 years? And that's all you got. Well, I did. I had a pretty good time existing. Jesus. Yeah. Don't <laughs> the opportunities of life are so vast, are so amazing, are so beyond what's possible. 
why would you not experience the incredibleness that life is emotionally, physically, and every other way? Mm. If you just open the door, stop being afraid, stop, just do it. And it's, you know what? You might get hurt a little bit along the way. Mm. You might, it's going to hurt. You might, it's, it's going to happen. You might have to do some really hard work, both emotionally, spiritually, physically. You actually are going to have to for sure do some physically if you're going to be vital enough mm. to do that. Because most people aren't experiencing any of those emotional massive benefits because they don't feel good enough to do anything. Yeah. I want to feel like there's fire in my veins all the time. So I train my bot like <laughs> I just got another sign from her, but <laughs> 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 all the time. All the time. And it's and here's the thing, it's there in you. So you got to cultivate it. You got to throw the gasoline on it. Do whatever it takes. Spend the time that you have in the things that explode your imagination. And and find the way in your mate to be exploded with her and to be uh, mm-hmm. to be in that in the way that you physically do things and the way that you that you read and learn and function and 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 live and play and all those things. Just find it. It's there. You just have to open the door. You have to turn the volume up. Knock the barriers out. Whatever it is. Stop being embarrassed that you, you know, I, listen, I realize that I, people watch me and they're like, that guy is nuts. He looked crazy. <laughs> I flat don't care. I'm having so much more fun and I'm living so much more powerfully than most of you. You can make fun of me all you freaking want. If you had any idea the level of passion existing in my life from moment to moment, hmm. you'd stop laughing and jump into my shit. Yeah. Super powerful, man. That's definitely it. And, and talking about just, you know, coming bloody full circle is you actually ended up magna cum laude when you finished your studies as a chiropractor. You, 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 you came a massively long way. Obviously, you just mentioned all these other things you're busy with. Was it was that like a, a good, a big moment for you? Well, I can't say that the I had done well in, in school prior to the professional school and then in professional school. So it wasn't like, uh, I was grateful for that. It wasn't mm-hmm. like the super amazing thing. And I'm very grateful because I knew I had one of the top grades. I had a desire to learn and everybody had that same desire. I mean, whatever they requested in school, I always multiplied it times 10. So if you have a textbook to read, I'd read 10 of them at the minimum. Mm-hmm. And I always, uh, the, the clinical requirements I multiplied times 10. I, I didn't want to be average. I wanted to excel. And so I, uh, so when I got that, I wasn't overly surprised because of the work I'd put into it. But um, I'm very grateful for that because I don't know if anybody really asks you when you're in practice whether or not, you know, were you at the top of the class or bottom of the class? I don't think they ever ask you that. It didn't really matter to anybody else, but it, it, was, a, it was a sign that I made the effort. And uh, so I'm grateful for that. Yeah. But I, I uh, see what happened is when I went, I left Hawaii. I flew back to Los Angeles. I hitchhiked back to Texas. Uh, and right when I, before I got to my parents' house, my dad and my sister drove by and didn't recognize me. No way. Long hair and hair. They didn't even wow. know who I was. <laughs> they went driving right past me and I waved at them. They thought I was kind of a weird character on the street there. I get home and my mom and dad, uh, they welcomed me home and they said, you know, uh, why don't you take a GED while you're here? Which is a high school equivalency exam and I thought well I got nothing to lose if I pass it great if I got a, I got a high school degree if I don't no big deal I did it and I guessed and I passed with the help of a little affirmation that Paul Bragg gave me that I'm a genius and I apply my wisdom he told me to say that every single day I never missed a day I've never missed a day in 46 and a half years <laughs> Anyways. and then uh, I passed that I passed a college entrance exam by guessing purely guessing it was I really <laughs> felt that there was some sort of higher power or something happening here and then when I first took my first college exam uh, from a from a class, um, I failed. I got a 27, and I needed 72 to pass. I got a 27. Uh-huh. And I really was depressed, and I really was just crying in my car. And I was driving home, and I was crying, and I thought, "Man, this whole thing's a delusion. I'm not going to have what it takes." And I could hear my first grade teacher talking to me. Mm. I'll never read, write, communicate, and amount thing that would go very far in life. I came home, and I curled up in a fetal position under this Bible stand in my living room of my parents' house. And my mom came home from shopping and she said, what's wrong, son? What happened? I told her that I blew the test. I guess I don't have what it takes. I guess I'll never be able to do this. 
And she didn't know what to say. She just paused for a moment. And then she put her hand on my shoulder and she said, son, whether you become a great teacher, healer, and philosopher and travel the world like you dream, whether you ride giant waves on the North Shore that you've done, or whether you return and panhandle on the streets as a bum, I just want to let you know that your father and I are going to love you no matter what. Hmm. And in that moment of unconditional love, in that moment of certainty and presence and gratitude, uh, my hand went into a fist. I closed my eyes and I saw the vision of the night that I was with Paul Bragg of me speaking in front of a million people. And uh, I said to myself, I'm going to master this thing called reading and studying and learning and teaching and healing and philosophy. And I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to travel at a distance and pay with a price to give my service of love. I'm not going to let any human being on the face of the earth stop me, not even myself. And I made this commitment to myself. There was a no turning back moment. And I gave up and I gave, up, gave a hug to my mom and I went into my room and I got a dictionary out and I started in the very beginning of it and I started memorizing 30 words a day. And my mom tested me on this pronunciation, spelling, application, meaning, and, and uh, using it in a sentence. And I really, really mastered 30 words a day. So at the end of 365 days, you know, you've, you've, you've grown your vocabulary. Wow. And, and, I, and I just kept doing that. And for the next couple of years, I basically memorized much of that book. And um, my, my vocabulary grew, and I started passing school, and then I started excelling, and I started reading encyclopedias. I read eight complete sets of encyclopedias and read everything I could get my hands on hours a day. When I was about to turn 19, my mom said, what do you want for your birthday and for Christmas? I was born on Thanksgiving Day, and she said, what do you want? And I said, I want the greatest teachings on the face of the earth, the greatest writings that humanity has ever created from around the world, from the greatest minds. She looked at me and she said, you don't need a cheat coach? And I said, no, mom, I want the greatest teachings on earth. Well, she called her brother, who was a, my uncle, a professor at MIT in physics and chemistry, and he sent a giant, two giant six by six foot by six foot wooden crates with thousands of books in it no down to our house on a flatbed truck. And they lowered it on the ground and I took a crowbar and opened up and filled my room with books and just sat for 18 to 20 hours a day reading. The only time I wasn't reading there, I was reading on the way to school and reading on the way back. And I just lived in books and I never stopped that. And I'm still reading every day. That's, <laughs> that's, that's just incredible. Wow. <laughs> um, your, all your, your folks and your mom sound like incredible people. And it's like, it's so that, that, having their backing and their love is so important and it sounds like it really changed things for you. Um, one thing which is super interesting and you've said about it, you know, you, 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 you wanted to do things 10 times. You became a voracious reader. How, how do you get through so many books? I mean, it's incredible. And like, what else inspired you to, to read so many books? I mean, you know, like, I think there's a story about you saying you can only read at, like, normal people can only read maybe like one book a month. And if you look at your whole life, that's not actually that many. Um, so, so yeah, how do you speed read and, and you know, what other things are there behind you wanting to consume all this information? Well, I guess when you didn't think you ever would, and all of a sudden you realize you can, it's, it's inspiring. And Every day I asked what worked and what didn't work, and I documented what was making me read faster or slower. I noticed if I sat in the sunny glare, I would go slower, and I tend to fade out a bit. If I drank water, cool water, if I sat up straight, if I had the book at an angle, um, I, I just started documenting what worked and what didn't work and created what was really a, a speed reading class. People started asking me to teach it after that. I never took a class in it. I just wanted to know what worked for me. And um, I started reading, you know, more and more. And I, I didn't, I, I'm the kind of guy that if I was to go to the bathroom, I would read 10 pages on the way to the bathroom, sit, read another 20 pages, then <laughs> walk back another 10 pages. I'd go to the restaurant, I'd walk and read 10, 20 pages, sit and wait for my food, read, you know, so many pages and come back. I used every minute of the day for learning. And I had books always within my grasp uh, when I was in professional school. And I got up at two in the morning, did meditation and yoga for 30 minutes, and then uh, started speed reading. By the time I was 23, 24, I was uh, knocking out four to seven books in the morning between 2.30 in the morning till 6.30. No <laughs> About a book an hour, a book every 45 minutes. And then I would go jogging, come back in, shower, go to school, 
until the afternoon, go to clinic and then come back at seven at night and teach whatever the books that I'd read. And I started having students that didn't really care what I was talking about. They just would come to class every night. And that's how I paid. I charged $20 for those sessions and, and I paid for school that way. I made about $100,000 a year when I was 23, 24, teaching classes every night. And uh, that way I could buy books because I was buying between 40 and 70 books a week. And uh, I was just reading and learning and, and teaching. And I, I never really stopped that except now I'm teaching more and my reading has dropped and it's now a lot online. So I don't have to buy all the books as much now. And people <laughs> give me books all the time. <laughs> but uh, I carry a bag of books with me. I'm always carrying uh, bags of books. Oh, nice. And, uh, there, there's back here and in my bags I've carried them. So I'm, I'm reading. Uh, it's my life. So. Thanks for sharing that story with us. It's, I think there's a lot of lessons for a lot of us in there and um, well done for sort of patching things up. I think that's also important relationships and finding, finding the, that, the, the common ground again, you know? Um, yeah. So eventually the, the company IPO'd and uh, listed on the stock exchange, as you mentioned uh, around 2016. Um, and that day, you made enough money to actually never have to work again in your life at 28 years old. Yes. It was a brief sort of euphoric moment though, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So we actually went to the stock exchange. Funny story on my birthday when I turned 28 <laughs> and me and Emil, we are born in the same hospital on the same day by parents who knew no way. So it was 28th birthday as well. And it wasn't even us who decided on the day. It was some bank, some guy just suggested this day and like, okay. <laughs> so it was obviously the best birthday gift I could have <laughs> <laughs> wished for. Taking the company to the stock exchange and getting to ring this golden bell and open the wow. stock exchange. And yeah, I, I made a lot of money uh, that day. The biggest thing going back is like, it's a feeling of relief. Like I'd been pushing myself in a way that I know wasn't sustainable. The last year, I remember, I couldn't talk about work outside of the office without feeling tears coming up. Hmm. Oh. I have this clear memory of sitting in a group of, uh, of entrepreneurs in a Swedish entrepreneur network where we had this meeting where we're going to help people with each other's problems. And I had a lot of energy when I was helping the other people, seeing what they needed to go through, came into with answers. And, and then they asked me, it's like, okay, Eric, what are you going through? And I remember that I physically couldn't speak. I, I just felt the words getting stuck in my throat and felt tears like, really don't want to talk about my problems because if I open that faucet, it's not going to close. Mm. And that was all that last year leading up to, to the IPO and, and ringing this bell. So mm. my main feeling was relief and, and survival. I, I don't think I even thought that much about money at the time. And once that had landed in a bit, then I got to this point of, of euphoric feeling saying that, okay, Eric, you made it. You, you will never have to work another day in your life if you don't want to. You will be safe and secure. You can travel wherever you want to go. And you've reached all the goals and all your targets. You've reached, yeah, if, using the analogy of money again as a religion, it's like, yeah, you're in heaven. You're hmm. set. You can you're just, enlightened, yeah. Yeah, if, if the religion is true, if heaven is there, then having all the money is there. Mm. And I mean, if, if you reach a goal, something you really strive for, something you're really passionate about, how long do you think that feeling lasts? Yeah, it's very temporary, isn't it, generally? Yeah. For me, I think it lasted a week, maybe two, something like that. And then things got back to normal. And I remember I was fighting with my girlfriend and I mean, those problems hadn't gone away. We still struggled in, in many ways. 
I, I got a cold, I got really sick. It's like, okay, that doesn't go away because I have money. And yeah. all these small little things that I somehow had imagined would never happen if I just had money, they were equally freaking real and the pain from those were the same. So I started to feel that, okay, this whole money religion thing was a lie. There's, there's no heaven. There's no holy gate. <laughs> and that led to a feeling of, of emptiness. And yeah, I was, once again, I, I think I felt, yeah, like, like money let me down or like everything that I had expected to happen didn't happen. I felt like I was promised, I'd made it, I promised myself that I would be happy if this happened. And then I, it didn't last. It was all, it felt like everything was alive. So I went into soul searching land. I actually ended up breaking up with my girlfriend because we didn't manage to solve those issues. And for the last four years, I had just been working. So I hadn't really thought about our relationship. And then all of those problems that I'd just been distracting myself for, they were suddenly insanely real. <laughs> and I was so lost without her. We had been together for seven years and now I didn't know up from down. I didn't know where I wanted to do. I didn't know anything. <laughs> and yeah, we I had went on a soul searching journey to uh, to Africa and starting to involving myself in, in a lot of different charities. And yeah, that gave me a lot of perspective on things. And I saw saw things that I knew was going on on a rational level, but I'd had no emotional connection to to the poverty and the things that happen in the world. And see, what can I do to do this? And I started to find meaning there. There's so many like powerful lessons in there, I think, for, for anybody that's uh, starting a business or, you know, as an entrepreneur and is seeking, you know, this sort of, you know, this, this end game of like a payout and stuff. And that's, that's just not necessarily what it's all about, but also you need to enjoy that journey more and, um, you know, just take care of yourself and take care of your relationships and stuff too. And make sure that you communicate, like you said, the one, the biggest things in the world you want to resolve what you think is a big issue is communication and and it sounds like you know you'd stop communicating with those that were close to you and who you really should have been communicating with um and and not just speaking you know like your you said your missus you guys split up and one of the big issues uh was that i think you know you'd probably stopped having sex and stuff um yeah. or, uh, so yeah like how how did you tackle that eventually you know what yeah, so going into that challenge. So, so Johanna, my fiance, we're actually back together uh, now after a long time. We, she was working in the company as well. And I, I, can, I have a very big sex drive and she's normal, I would say. So it's mainly me or just somewhere on the extreme end of the scale. And obviously both she got quite badly burned out from this as well so no one had a healthy relationship to how much we worked mm. and that obviously took a big hit on our on our sex life and everything around it and i'm a person who is a deep need of that connection and if that doesn't happen it impacts everything around me and it's permeates and it's, it, it hurts everything and I can see all the mistakes I did in, in our relationship going back to communication that I was passively aggressive about these things like I yeah. got grumpy I got mad I didn't talk about it. it's not like I the, the mature thing would probably have been to sit down and say hey I'm feeling this and that right now I feel lonely inside I feel rejected i'm i don't know what to do I'm, I'm desperate to solve this and instead i probably woke up early in the morning left bed went out slammed the door and kind of didn't say anything which isn't an optimal way of, of communicating and she ended up feeling 
like I didn't love her or like everything was her fault and mm. not understanding me or yeah, all of these these challenges. And I think this is another aspect of entrepreneurship and, and, and business life that is very rarely talking about. And I personally believe that, so this, this comes from a, a good friend of mine. He's a, a sex relationship expert and has been a mentor of mine for a couple of years. And he told me that a lot of the things that make someone a great entrepreneur makes them really shitty in a sexual relationship. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. So at a little bit of a sad uh, point of your life, I would imagine you, you at some, at some stage you obviously sort of came off the drugs and then unintentionally you kind of replaced the drugs with a bit of a, an abusive relationship. Um, and your partner at the time was physically abusive. Um, that must've been a really tough and traumatic time. Mm. Yeah, it was a terrible time. It's not something that you, you don't go into a relationship thinking that you'll be harmed. Mm. You know, and it was my first relationship uh, with a woman. And so I think there was also that much more weight on it, that much more expansiveness on it, that much more everything. You know, it's kind of like I, I found something I, I really wanted to ex experience, maybe experiment with and experience. And yeah, you never walk into one of those situations thinking that you're going to walk out of it a very different person. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, I did in many ways, I did replace the pain of whatever pain I was dealing with when I was, you know, wildly into drugs with an abusive relationship that I didn't get out of the first, second or third time that any of the um, acts of, you know, violence happened. Yeah, it's so, super. You know, gotta, yeah. gotta live with that. Yeah, it's. I think it's so tough. Like, um, you know, you you see people that are that are in these sort of relationships, and you're like, "What are you doing? Just get out!" But it's not. It's never. It's never like that. It's not easy like that at all because you you're terrified basically, and um, you if you try get out, it's going to be even kind of worse. Um, yeah. So yeah, you also mentioned that like you felt like a fair bit of shame that like some, you know, somebody was hitting you like just very, very tough times. That's for sure. Yeah. It's an, it's just an emotional, mental, you know, F you up here. Mm. Yeah. That's going on. But I think for me, you know, I didn't to be, to be really clear, I stayed because I thought I could fix her. Mm -hmm. I thought that. I had something that would be a special blanket for her that would help her out of her own pain. And then eventually I stayed because I was afraid to leave because you know, she was just not, not, not well. Yeah. Uh, and then I left. And then one yeah. day I left. Wow. I, I guess as well, though, there's a, there's a point where, you know, the, the abusive side of a relationship is only a percentage and there's a lot of other good in the relationship. And, and I guess it's easy when you love someone that, like you say, you can either fix or you can also be like, well, you know what? It's, there's so much good in the relationship too. I mean, I would imagine. And it's, no. it's <laughs> not that one, <laughs> not that one. Early on. No, we oh, passed the wow. good, we passed tough, the good early on. Um, yeah, it was, it was also, you know, I, so we've, we've talked about now a few things that have made me who I am. Um, dyslexia, being athletic, uh, experimenting with drugs and kind of, you know, wanting to break on through to the other side in many ways, the death of friends and being in an abusive relationship. And every single thing that I just mentioned to you has allowed me to relate and be with people as they are every single thing. Mm. And so would I take away the pain that I felt? Yeah, sure. I don't I didn't need, we need to feel all of that pain. Mm. However, mm. I wouldn't be sitting here had I not gone there. And I, I actually wouldn't be me. I don't, I think I would be a more selfish version of me. I think I would be mm. a more 
I don't, I would not be, you know, I just wouldn't have the same heart, I don't think. I don't know. Yeah, I you really have to invest in your people if you want a successful business. It, it seems so obvious, but businesses don't do it. Yeah, it seems so obvious, doesn't it? Yeah. I think that Maybe. there are certain businesses that are, are run for, for bottom top line growth, and that's really it. And there are certain businesses that just exist to just be fearful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then there are certain businesses that want to change the world. And those are the businesses and those are the leaders I want to be with. Mm -hmm. We are in, we're in a market, we're a marketing, advertising, creative agency. I mean, call it what you want. You know, we're a digital agency for the now. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. But the fact that we are obsessed with how we treat human beings is what is going to make us win. Because if you come from that place, and think about the creativity that can spring forward that way. You know, you're not worried about your job. You're not worried about your job. What you want to do is you want to have the flexibility and the runway to create the most, you know, excellent, gorgeous, elegant, funny, whatever it is, piece of art, if you will, video that is going to touch lives. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's amazing as well off the back of what you both been saying there is that in, in doing what you're doing and, and creating this human environment, this caring, you know, uh, loving environment, you're also being watched by so many people and, you know, the super successful company has that as its core. Other people are going to be like, you know, we, sh you know, it's a great example in other words. And, and I think that's also really cool. It's not just, it's, it rubs off, let's say on other companies seeing that, but this is now actually people, this is the way forward. And this is how we create good long-term healthy companies. And I think, you know, that's, that's definitely something that we super, ins you know, inspired to see. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the wave, you know, we're on the wave. Mm. It does take quite a while for waves to build, as my South African friends know. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a surfer, you've got to look way in the back to see where the swell's coming from. But eventually, yeah. it will come. Mm. And this revolution that's happening here, where we're putting human beings back into the workplace and bringing humanity back and tenderness back and giving a you know what about the people who are actually creating what it is you sell mm. that revolution is happening and it's just going to take a while and so you know play the long game <laughs> rome wasn't built in a day we'll get there because everything else will i do i truly believe that the way millennials are going and the way gen z is going and the generations that are going to come are not going to stand for this other kind of antiquated you know, top line, bottom line, roar. They, they want to work with purpose and passion and they want to be respected as human beings, not as cogs in the wheel. You know, they want to be seen as having heartbeats. That's, that's my, that's my POV. You know, that's, it's one woman's opinion. Yeah. And, and, and like, I, like exactly what you said, I reckon, one of the most important things in life now, if you want to be successful, is discipline. And it might not sound flippant cool because you're like, why? I want flexibility in my life. No, if you want flexibility, you need to be disciplined. Otherwise, you'll never enjoy that flexibility because you have to focus on something. 100%. It's so true. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and discipline is, is huge. It's so huge. And all, all the successful people of the world, if you were to dissect them, and obviously you've spoken with a lot of people on here, guys, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a pattern. You've probably seen that there, there will be disciplines that people have, rituals they do every day. Mm. And that's why they're successful, right? Because they're, they're programmed in. It's like we, we, we do things every day consistently and we commit to them over time, and that's where the results come. You don't just get them overnight. Mm. You definitely don't get them by jumping from thing to thing every mm. couple of minutes. And it, it's nobody's fault. I think it's just the way people are evolving now um, through the world. There's, there's so much choice. There's so much to choose from. It's very difficult to stay focused because 
It's like, well, I don't know what I like. Do I like this? Well, actually, this is not bringing me joy. It's not bringing me fulfillment. It's not releasing the dopamine in my brain. I can't, I don't like this. Let's go to something else. It's like, and then mm. usually it's those quick fixes of, I don't know, likes on a Facebook post. And it's like checking the phone, dopamine mm. hits. Oh, wow, yes, yeah. And it's like, well, you've got to be studying. You have to be doing your training. Oh, that can wait. It's not, mm. you know, so it's like, it's very difficult to manage, I think, with, um, with a lot of people, especially as kids. And that's why it's very important that they don't develop these habits early on. And you see it in the street now. There's, there's adults walking around like plugged in all day, like yeah. just doing nothing, just like scrolling on social media. And they don't know they're doing it. And I'm a bit of a strange one. When I go out into the coffee shop in the morning, I like to engage with people. <laughs> Isn't it? It's mad. mad. How you want to interact with other human beings like crazy. Who yeah. would think that? <laughs> They're uh, like, hey, what's wrong with this guy? He's like saying hello to me. Like, is, <laughs> is, he, is he a bit weird or something? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it, it's, it's true, you know. But again, we were mentioning earlier the people of Wales kind of say good morning and things. But um, you, you just go into a Starbucks and everyone is like glued. Mm. To the phone, and I mm. sit there and I'm like, I just want to chat to somebody. I feel yeah. disconnected, you know. Yeah, I feel yeah, disconnected yeah. from people. Hey, how's it going? It's like, hey. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You know, bud. Exactly. There's no. There's no depth to any of them. You know, and it's 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 a shame. Mm. It's not everyone, but it's it's very it's very evident in society. I think today that that's what's going on, and there's there's got to be some sort of intervention. But so bad. Two years ago, uh, you had basically um, a big decision to make, or you made a big decision. Uh, you had served for 18 years um, in the army uh, in various different roles. Uh, like you said, you're a combat engineer. Uh, in, at the Royal Engineers, you were a Sergeant Major in the Royal Army Physical Training Corps. And then you decided to pack it all in. Now, it wasn't an easy decision, was it? Hmm. No, no, absolutely not. It was, um, I even still question it like now. It's like, did I, did I make the right move? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and yeah, absolutely I did, but it's still, you know, questionable. Uh, not many people get it. You know, not many people can fathom it because, again, we are our own limitations. We all have our own beliefs and we all have our own ceilings that everyone's capable of smashing through no matter what level you're at. But again, it's what you believe. And you know, the whole, you know, people call it cheesy or whatever, but what you believe you can achieve. And I, I totally, I, I stick by that. And I still will, you know, no matter what anyone says, I stick by that every single day. And I think, you know, once I, I done, I mean, I started to kind of, listen have you heard of Jim Rohn you must have heard of Jim Rohn yeah, uh, one of my favorites I, I have like I've subscribed to all of his stuff and I, I listen <laughs> to something Jim Rohn every day as part of a like a ritual so even if it's just 10 minutes in the morning it just it brings things back in line you know it's like I was worrying about that shut up this is good you know we're, we're, we're okay and it brings things back into context and these teachings are just like they're timeless you know you, he was talking 30 40 years ago on stages and you listen to a speech that long ago and it's still impactful now mm. it's the same nothing's really changed and it was one day i came back from work i was working in purbright where i did basic training when i went for my selection so i went back there as an instructor to train the recruits and help the injured recruits so i was running all the rehab at the um, army training center for the recruits. So if they got injured during training, they would come over to me and I would kind of help them not only with like mindset and belief and all that sort of stuff, but also physically as well, doing stuff that they could do that were in their means. So they weren't out running with the troops because they were injured. They were doing stuff with me indoors to keep their fitness up, right? So that was kind of like my role there. I loved it, a great role. One of my favorite jobs in the army that was because I used to get to shout at recruits and really beat them. <laughs> And, but the thing is with recruits, this is the great thing. They're like sponges and they, they want to learn, right? They're there to learn and they, they listen to you. When you get into the, the field army where people are kind of conditioned to, I know best, this is what I do. You shouldn't be telling me this kind of thing. Like, like old dog, new tricks again, right? With the recruits, they're brand new, they're keen, they're bright eyed. It's like, tell me what I need to do and I'll do it and I'll listen. And they do. And, and that was the great thing about it is because they, they wanted to learn from you. So it was good for us as instructors because we could go onto the gym floor and onto the shop floor and actually start doing what we did best, which was educating, coaching, all these people who wanted to be coached. It was great. Mm -hmm. I loved them. Great, great, um, great role in the military. Um, so where was I going there? It's like totally uh, just gone off on one now. This is, this is about, um, I guess, your transition from... That's it. Yeah, got it. So while I was a Purbright, 
um, I had a good friend of mine, James, uh, he's doing very well in, um, in the network marketing space at the moment, like really well, great guy. And, um, yeah, and, we, and he's a good friend, you know, he's a real good friend. He said to me while I was in, cause he was in the same cap badge. So we were, he was in the PT core. He just left. And I'm like, why is he left? You know, I was inquisitive. Like, why is he left the PT core? He was doing pretty well. Um, and he sent me this video and he just said, oh, you should go watch this video. Um, it's a guy called Jim Rohn. This is in 2013, 14, maybe. And uh, it's when I just got back from Afghanistan. And um, he, um, I watched this video. I got back from work one day and I put it on the, on, the, on the iPad. I had my dinner on my lap. I was still in my uniform. Mm -hmm. And I turned, I turned this, um, this video on of Jim Rohn. And it's, it was called How to Have the Best Year of Your Life right? Or the best year ever or something like that. And it's four hours long. It's a four hour video. And I'm like, four hours? Wow. Okay. It's, it's like, it's half six PM. Um, I'll watch a bit of it and I'll, I'll, I'll watch the rest tomorrow. Anyway, four hours later, I'm still there in my uniform. I have an empty plate like next to me. And I, I remember standing up and just thinking, oh shit, my, my life just changed. I'm up, no my, my, yeah. Like that. Just like my, my path has just changed. I had a lot of notes on my notepad and, and, and I couldn't get, I was kind of like feeling guilty. It was like this guilty feeling of, well, hang on. I feel guilty towards the army because my eyes have just been open to what's actually possible outside of the army. Right. Mm -hmm. So it, it really opened my eyes up to what, you know, what potential there is out there and what other things you can do. Cause I've done like mm -hmm. at this point, it's like a 16 year point. So it's quite a long time of the same stuff and different things. Great time I had in the army. What was the, the message in there that kind of what was the actual thing that sparked like, you know what I mean? Like what was the message there? I, I remember exactly what it was. It was something uh, that Jim said about um, how we all fall into our like safety blankets and our safety secure routines where if you really took those breaks off and you went out and you, you, you've seen how much potential a human being can have by taking those breaks off, putting yourself in different circles of people learning from people who are already like higher up and successful in the world. And you put yourself around them rather than staying around your usual circle, you know, all these things can happen. And I've always had this kind of like, what else is there, you know, from a young age, like from the age of like five, six, like, cause I've seen all these people doing all these things, people having nice cars, nice houses, you know, more fulfillment, more money, more travel, you know, Beth, you know, all everything. So it's kind of like, well, why, why don't I have that? So this has always been subconscious from a young age, mm. but I never really explored it because I didn't have any direction or any guidance with any of it. So it kind of just stayed there. Didn't go away subconsciously. It was all programmed in from a young age. But then that video brought it to the front. Mm. And I was kind of like, oh, wow. Now, now I understand. It was, like a pen, it was like a bucket of water in the face. It was like, <laughs> I remember standing up and going, my life's just changed. I tried. So Bernie, your story is, is quite incredible. And um, as with all of us, your childhood and environment affects the rest of your life. And uh, uh, yours was not that uncommon for the, the area that you actually lived in. So, yeah. so maybe you can take us back to the streets of Hanover Park as a youngster and uh, the way you kind of remember it. You know, um, I think my, 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 my furthest back as, as I can remember, um, we all know that Hanover Park is, is ridden with crime and, and, and drugs and stuff, you know. But for me, it was home, you know, you almost, you, you, the this, this situation becomes normalized when you're there. So for, for me to walk around and uh, see people on the street, like a, a guy that was drunk from last night, still sleeping on the street or something like that, it's, it's pretty normal, you know. It's only when you leave Hanover Park, when you realize how abnormal we were and how abnormal we are in that, uh, in the system there. So my memories of, of Hanover Park is, is really, and unfortunately, it's only about gang fights over the weekend, a lot of church, oh, because my dad was a, he's a pastor and I grew up in church. So it was a lot of church, uh, literally seven days a week, a Monday, seven days a week and twice on a, on a Sunday. So a lot of church. <laughs> And a lot of, of uh, like, because my, my brother was a, a bit of a gangster before he was, he was openly a gangster, you know, I was a little undercover. So he was openly a gangster. And then what happened was, uh, what I do remember is go going to school always uh, took me about 30 minutes, a walk that would be for you, for anybody, probably seven or eight minutes, took me just over 30 minutes to get to school because I couldn't walk 
like that I had to go all the way into Lansdowne Road, walk all the way up Lansdowne Road because you had to dodge the wildcats, dodge the Americans. These are gangs. So, you know, then I have to walk all the way down Vanguard Drive just to get to, to Crystal, to the school. So, yes. uh, and again, that becomes, it becomes the norm, you know? Um, yeah, so it, it's good. I, I, I say it, all these bad things, I mentioned all these bad things about Hanover Park, but it's also, there's a sense of community there, which I've never found, which I still don't find in the suburbs in Santon, wherever I live. You know, there's a sense of community. And uh, when I lived in, uh, in Bahrain, in the UAE, I, one thing I really, when I came back to, to South Africa, I embraced the fact that here we don't have the problems that they have in Europe and over there where Muslims hate Christians. And if you go to Hanover Park, it's unbelievable the respect the Muslims have for the Christians and vice versa, you know? Mm -hmm. So everybody just lives together. They'll be like, because, you know, the Muslims don't drink. Um, they smoke a lot of buttons, though. And, uh, <laughs> and, you know, so the Christians would respect. They would say, like, Nai, you know, you can't go drink there because those are Muslims. Like, just, they just have this respect. So there's that sense yeah. of community. And, uh, you know, when they're fasting, when they're doing their, like now their Ramadan, they would come to the Christian's house, they bring barakat. So mm -hmm. at, when they break their fast at the end of the night, they wouldn't just go to the mood, they'd go to, to Christian families as well. So in that we have a, there's a very strong sense of community in, in, the, in, those, in those townships and stuff. And um, mm -hmm. so as much as I took uh, bad things that happened to us over there, and it's, uh, you know, they, the one thing I can say is that the people are, they stand up for each other, you know? It's almost like if you're all, if, you, if there's a foot on all of you, if you all press down together, you know, so you'll have to push up together kind of thing. Yeah. So that's yeah. how we are there, yeah. Yeah, that's, um, that's super cool, man. I, I actually, um, I've been like into the sort of middle Soweto a couple of times. Um, yeah. And it's, it's the same thing there, the same story that you said, you know, like there's yeah. obviously all the, the bad things that happen, but yeah. there is that sense of community, like literally have got each other's back, which is super yeah. powerful. And um, you mentioned church and, you know, your dad being a yeah. pastor, he was like highly respected, highly, um, highly respected. Yeah. And, but you were yourself an atheist. So yeah. how did that kind of go down? You know, you know, I, I, I do believe that we are all born atheists because you can't born uh, loving or bowing down to a deity. Mm. You know, I think we're all born atheists and, and we get sort of pushed into the direction of whatever our parents tell us to obey. All right. So like if I was born in, in Saudi Arabia, what is the likelihood of me being Muslim? I'd be Muslim. If I was born in Tel Aviv. I'd probably be a Jew. So I was in the beginning stages of my life. I was forced into this, but I didn't feel like I was forced, you know. Um, mm. But my, I, I always had this yearning to want to know more. I think my philosophy in probably in life is like, uh, don't, I, I ask questions. I question everything, you know. So growing up, I wanted to question things. Why, 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 why? And then I can say officially I lost my religion uh, about 20 years ago. You know, it, it, didn't, it could not have happened in Hanover Park. Mm -hmm. I, would, I, I, would, I would bet a lot of money that there's very, the, the amount of atheists in Hanover Park is few and far between because <laughs> religion is part of your culture. And it's almost like, I, I, you know, I, I can't even tell anybody in Hanover Park that I'm an atheist because for them, translated atheist means devil worshiper. Yeah, yeah. Means 666, exactly. six, you, yeah. which, and you just try to explain to them, no, it just means I don't believe there's not enough evidence for what you are saying, you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, even my father, I've never really outright, to, I mean, it's, it's more of a respect thing. I was like, you know, they, they really, really, really believe in this. But if you actually go out there and you discover, and I, why I think I became an atheist was because I took the time out when I went, when I lived, like I told you, in the, uh, in the UAE. I spent a lot of time with Sunni Muslims and I spent a lot of time with Shia Muslims. And because I had this yearning all the time to, for new things and to learn and to want to see, I understood the religion. And then I realized, oh, my God, there's so much. They, they actually have some, there's some, uh, some fact or some good things in, 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 in Islam. 
I came back to South Africa and then I spent a lot of time and I lived in, in, um, in the bastion of Judaism, which is Santon and Joburg, you know? <laughs> and I lived there and I, I had a lot of friends that, that were Jewish. And I began to, underst- to understand their, uh, their religion as well. And I opened up to it, you know? And uh, I had a lot of good friends there. And then when I moved to Thailand, I actually went up into the mountains and I lived with the monks for two months to understand <laughs> Buddhism. So what it did was, when I had a great understanding of all these religions, I could then understand that, hold on, but according to each one of them, they write. So clearly, it can't be like that, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah, and then I just went deep and I realized, hold on, but I'm, um, I, I mean, it's really for me, it's, uh, being an atheist is not the hatred of religion, it's the encompassing of, 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 of everybody, you know? Yeah. So people really think if you're an atheist, you hate, I don't hate religion. I hate what people do because people really, they, they, there's good people that believe in, in religion. I'm, I've no doubt that there's good people. Mm. But then if somebody can blow themselves up because they believe that strongly in a religion, then it becomes a problem. You know, mm-hmm. if, 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 if the crusades can happen because of, then it becomes a problem, you know. So mm. um, to those people, I have an issue. But I can tell you right now that actually being an atheist made me a better person because now when I, I did, I don't discriminate if you're Muslim, if you're Jewish, if you, if you need, I'm going to help you. It, and, and Christians will deny it. They will definitely deny it if you ask them. Uh, but if there's a Christian person and a Muslim person in need, I will, I'll, again, I'll put money on this. They're going to help the Christian person first. You know, <laughs> it's, I don't do that. Actually, I think when you become, when you ru- lose your religion, you see everybody as there's a needy child, you know, and it's not like, oh, yes. they're Muslim. They, f- I, I feel the same way about a kid in Mecca that's starving than I do about a kid uh, in, in a Burundi that's starving, you know? So, yeah. Mm. So I'm, exactly. I'm very, it's a, it's a good choice I made. It's a lifestyle choice. I just, unfortunately, there's a, we get discriminated against a lot because Mm. people don't understand it. But then the other thing that happened that was like a real turning point was that I was on, you know, social media and I said something or other about how great Italy was. And in what I call the universe's great gift to me, there was somebody who came along and kind of wet blanket. Well, not everybody can just go off to Italy for the summer. And it was such a great gift because the person who said it was somebody who I knew made twice as much money as me, mm-hmm. lived in a less expensive place than the San Francisco Bay Area, and was in a dual income household because I was just wow. had my own income, but they had a partner as well. Plus, they had paid vacation. I didn't have paid va- wow. vacation. Mm-hmm. And it's something clicked. And that's why I call it a gift. You know, this wet blanket, well, not everybody can do it. Because she could have, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and been paid th- for three weeks vacation to go to Italy um, and ha- made a lot more money. And, and it was like, oh, oh, okay. I was willing to go without the lattes for six months. I was willing to not buy new clothes. I was willing to not have cable TV. I was willing to not, you know, have, you know, rent movies every single, I was ready to, willing to not go out to dinners in the United States randomly in order to be able to afford what felt like at the time the trip of a lifetime and I it could have been a great risk and it could have been um maybe I'd gone and maybe I would have hated it been the first person in the world to hate going to Italy and eating gelato but um it didn't happen that way but it could have and I was afraid to do it but I was willing to lean into the discomfort of that and that was when I actually made the connection like oh this is what courage actually is this is it right here. This is what it looks like, you know? Wow. Amazing. And the courage to do the hard work. And like you say, and, and that's also really courageous to say, I'm not going to do this and that. And, um, you know, and we should also just take a moment to acknowledge how amazing Positano is. And uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that the fact that you didn't mention the limoncello there, but that's okay. Well, that's for another podcast. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Well, Florence actually has my heart. That's that's oh, really yeah. the the area. Rome is a little too chaotic for me. The yeah. coast is beautiful, but really expensive and yeah. super touristy. But Florence, I really like, just loved it's it. Loved place. Florence. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so you mentioned that you actually did a sort of um, 
not succeed, let's say the first time that you you sort of left, what actually happened there? Um, I saved up some money and I, you know, I did this trip and I was like, I need to work for myself. This is the, you know, this is the time. And I, I felt really buoyed by my courage to saved up some more money and, uh, took a leave of absence from my job intending for it to be a permanent leave of absence. And within a couple months, it was like, oh yeah, it wasn't, if you build it, they will come. You know, it was like, you have to, you have to have more than that. And I once heard an interview with Scott Belsky, um, and he talked about the concept of you have to build yourself a runway. And when he said that, I really loved it. Cause I think with like any big dream, um, including like building a business, you know, when a plane takes off, the physics of flight are that you need enough velocity or power and you also need enough of a runway and you can't have like a long runway without enough power. You won't get off the ground and you also can't just have a lot of power, but not a runway because the two actually have to work together. And I think the same thing is true about where I was in that place. It's like, I needed the, you know, I keep wanting to go like this. <laughs> um, I needed the, 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 the the length of the runway is time and the velocity is the effort you're putting in the direction of your dream and you've got to have that effort and you've got to put it over time and mm. you you really just can't get one or the other there are a lucky few who create something and it is immediately well received and goes viral and they never have to work a day in their life again and we've all heard of those people but Really, if you dig into their stories, and you yeah. guys are in the business of this, so I bet you'll tell me it's true. What you find is that the the supposed luck was, you know, ten years of them doing something before they had a big break. So it might have come very fast when they had the big break, but actually the runway was building. Yeah, 100%. we we can't uh, relate to that more. Like <laughs> we 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 talk about this every single day about you know you just. Uh, <laughs> have to be patient in everything that you do, you know, and, um, and that's what we constantly remind ourselves about, you know, about our, our podcast in particular is like, you know, we got to do the good work, be consistent with it, be patient. Things will eventually happen. And, um, and the, the runway analogy is also really important, especially when it comes to finance, you know, like financially, you have to give yourself a, mm-hmm. a good enough runways to, to um, deal with those lean times when you're not earning money as a, as a new entrepreneur, because yeah, it's not easy. It's not anywhere near as easy as you might think. Um, I always think that working a full-time job is actually a lot easier than, than working as an entrepreneur. Um, And it's funny before I actually did the switch myself, I thought it was the complete opposite. You know, I thought it was like, cool, you're an entrepreneur. It's like flexible and like all this sort of thing. But, <laughs> <laughs> but actually it's a, it's a different, uh, it's a different ball game completely. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. No, but, but of course with it, you know, everything has like, you know, uh, say like good and bad and, and there's, there's, there's just so much other good stuff to it. So that's, mm. that's really cool. Um, but just, I guess, looking back now, like for yourself, you know, I guess in the last sort of nine years since you, you've, you've, gone full time in your coaching you've achieved a hell of a lot in, in a fairly short space of time you know you, you started with your one on one coaching you've now developed a coaching program uh, you've become a mom uh, you've written a book and you like just in, you've inspired i guess thousands of other people how does it kind of make you feel when you when you look back on those sort of 9 10 years now um hmm Well, it still feels funny to hear someone say you've done or succeeded or so much. You know, I don't, I don't sit around feeling like, ah, I've done so much. (laughs) It doesn't, (laughs) you know, it doesn't mean I'm not proud of the things I've done, but it just doesn't feel, um, that way. Um, I, I've always been really impatient for the success if, if you really must know, I, I've always wanted it to have happened five years earlier than it actually mm-hmm. happened. I wanted a book 10 years ago, you know, I wanted, and I, I can look at the right timing, but even now today, the things that I want for myself and for my life are, are like, Oh, I want it now. Like universe, if you're listening, I'm calling it in now. Like, let's <laughs> do it now. Like I'm, I'm ready now. Like I, you know, and I think that, um, 
I think when I, when I look at the trajectory of it all, I guess where I go is if I could tell myself anything that, that some of that wanting it to happen right away is like, because maybe I was afraid that it wouldn't happen. So I wanted the proof to show up as quickly as possible that it was viable. And it's been a huge growth lesson in letting things unfold organically and in their right timing at the same time that I would want to tell that, that person that I was when I first started, like, like it's actually going to be okay. Maybe mm. don't quit your job yet. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> wait for that part. Um, but it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. It really is an art to be a, a good guest as it is an art to be a good uh, host and interviewer, yeah. you know, and you, and you really need to, to practice these things and, and to find out what the good techniques and everything are like, you know, whichever side of the microphone you're on. The other thing that I, um, I've just coined the term uh, paintbrush words, hmm. um, being able to, to, to paint a picture. Um, you know, our tone is 38% of our communication and, and being able to, to vary your communication, your intonations, your, your, uh, cadence, you know, mm. the, those delivery styles, because the majority of podcasts are delivered on audio only. There's no privilege of seeing the tears that ran down my face or the laughter or the smile on yours. You know, there's no, there's no, you can't see that. So what we have now then is a requirement, if you will, for an extremely good storyteller. Someone who mm. wants, who makes you want to lean in and listen and then brings you back through it, just like a, a, a dream weaver. And, the, and they, and they kind of carry you along and then they take you and land you in this place that's safe. And it's storytelling and story weaving. And it's done with words that make you picture what it is that they're talking about. Because if you don't, you're going to lose that audience. The host will look bad. The guests will look bad. And nobody's going to benefit. And that's a shame because that's a waste of a story. Mm. I like what yeah. you did there. <laughs> yeah. That was good. Wow. Yeah, that was really like good. A moment yeah. to appreciate that. Yeah. yeah, you didn't even have to like talk. You just, yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's just like, your and it's, was just so amazing. It's, <laughs> there's so much like you, like you, you sort of um, alluding to that, Gareth, there's like a lot of power in silence sometimes too. And, and pauses, which is, which is often awkward and tough in the moment, but it really works, doesn't it? And it's like, yeah, just, just learning to be clear on your message is, is such a, so important before you be interviewed. So, so thanks for sharing those with us. Um, yeah. But talk, you know, talking about telling one story um, yeah. and how, you know, why is it actually um, so important for people to tell their story and, and how has it helped you? I appreciate that love. Um, the most significant, one of the most significant moments in my life was a, th- a therapist who's, whose attention um, changed my entire being. For once, I didn't feel crazy. And he acknowledged, accepted, and, um, and uh, sort of was compassionate, I guess. So uh, being heard is amazing. Being understood is incredible. Being accepted is transformative. And often that's all it takes. Maybe a person only has to tell their story once. And that's enough. Maybe it's more. But for both the listener and the speaker, everyone is transformed. Mm. Because vocalizing that story, and I say, we've all got a story and that we've literally lived to tell about it. Literally lived to tell about it. Uh, I, I cannot mean that any bigger. And I, um, So what happens is uh, the sharing of that is honest to God, the source of all fulfillment because you're giving back the thing that you came to give that you cultivated so freaking hard to have and you can't give it away if you don't own it first so there's the process for the speaker they have to own what they have you have to own it to give it and when you share it you get more (laughs) now look at that right Mm. that's so ironic (laughs) i think i've heard it uh, explained better before that's for sure that was amazing (laughs) thank you Um, yeah, I mean, we just find that 
just so powerful to actually tell your own story, you know, and, and we, we really encourage every single person in the world to tell their own story um, because it's twofold. It's actually quite cathartic in one sort of way, you know, like yeah. speaking about what you've done. It's nice remembering things that have happened as well. But then it's also good for other people to get to know you better. And it's just amazing. Like, uh, you know, we actually interviewed each other not too long ago. And it was so cool because, you know, it was good for us each because we actually wrote, you think your storyboard was long. We wrote like 11 pages <laughs> each. <laughs> it was almost like a <laughs> journal that we did for each other. But, um, but then, it, so that was cool. But then also just for like people that we'd been to school with and whatever, like they, it's amazing how many people reached out to us and they're like, wow, I didn't really know that about you or that was so cool or jeepers, you know, like I remember that at school and it was funny and um, it's just, we uh-huh. really, we really encourage everyone to, to tell their story and also to like, especially to your mates because mm-hmm. you think you know your friends, but actually you don't, you don't really, really know them a, a lot of the time no, you and don't. your fam and your family as well. Like, you know, like you don't always know like, what about your parents upbringing and whatever and even like while you were you know growing up with them you don't necessarily know a hell of a lot of stuff so you know if you have that sort of relationship it's really worth actually going and exploring their stories more too Mm. and like like you've said as well that being listened to and just being totally heard um, in a sort of an interview fashion is also very powerful you know it's just it feels really good and it's, uh, it's just a great feeling, isn't it? So there's so much good that comes from, from these kinds of conversations that, that, that you're having and that we're having and that kind of thing. In the, in the era of dis- disconnectivity in a world that's more connected than ever, but is more impersonal than ever, um, right? This is an opportunity to become basically a bedside mate with somebody that you wouldn't normally ever get to listen to on an extensive level. The interviews mm-hmm. you guys do, the depth that you go to, or the people that you feature, what a privilege. In the past, the only thing we could do to get close to close to someone like that was to buy their cassette series or maybe catch them on a show. And now we've got this opportunity to hear, you know, kind of like back in the day when um, Paul Harvey would say, and now for the rest of the story. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's yeah, why it's, so it's important. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. Yeah, it's super important. So, um, so yeah, I just wanted to. I guess we we haven't got a hell of a lot of time left with you. Um, and it's just been like amazing <laughs> speaking to you and you know hearing your story and you know uh, just sort of you know um, listening and like feeling your energy and it's just it's just really really amazing. <laughs> so. Um, it's a one woman show, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so just before we do like sort of finish off, cause we have a couple of questions we asked at the end. Like, I was just wondering, like, you know, I guess there's many, many ladies that, you know, are uh, suffering is not the right word, but you like we go through midlife crisis, not just ladies, but men too, you know, lots, you know, every, all of us, yeah. what kind of advice do you have for people in that sort of phase of their life? So um, that's a great question. Uh, there is a phenomenon uh, from, if you can think back to 28 to 31, there was an era of really big change for all of us. And, and looking forward, it was like, what am I doing with the rest of my life? Mm-hmm. You know, it's really intense, right? That's because there was this thing going on called the Saturn return. And it takes two or three years. Saturn return is really intense. And it makes us question where we're, who we are, what we're about. And you're so young. You don't know that you're that young when you're that young until you look back and go, God, I was young. (laughs) (laughs) But anyway, what happens is it comes back again. It comes back again, 29 and a half years later, Saturn return Mm. happens again. So this idea that midlife crisis and midlife crisis, that's a term that came up and it was, and it's supposedly around the age of 40 because people were living to be 80 
So, okay, the, I think the crisis part could be avoided if we made choices better back in the thir when we're 30 and made choices based uh, as we went along based on what I call the big yes. And that's that thing that defies logic, but it looks, it looks crazy to other people, but you know what? It's actually where you're supposed to be, where you're supposed to go. If I said, do you want to go to a party? And you'd be like, eh, not so much. You might what? Backpedal, fib. I got appointments. Nah, nah, nah. All you can do in the future is you could say, I'm not getting a big yes on that. And I'd be like, cool, no worries. Yeah. Um, so following the big yes is that feeling, that thing that pushes, that pulls, that says, I'm just still small boys. Come on, this way, this way. <laughs> and you listen to it, right? You know, if you listen to it, then you're not going to have a crisis later. So I'm just saying about that part. But as far as it goes in midlife, you know, the, the concept about it is, is a, a reassessment. Well, it's also one of the phenomenons about it is that uh, you, all the things that you accumulated, whether it's beliefs or a bunch of really bad hats or a lot of shoes or some really shitty people in your life, all of it, all of it goes, it goes. And, 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 and you're, you're then your, 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 your period of accumulation is now the opposite. You're uncluttering your mind, you're uncluttering your world, you're looking at what's next. And the, and the interesting part now is that we have people living three decades longer than they used to. That's a mm -hmm. long time. So what that means is we now have an area of life in which people don't even know what to do with themselves. They, they expected to retire at 55 or 60. I can't even imagine that now. But, but now they've got all this time. And what are they going to do with themselves? Well, hopefully... <laughs> Hopefully, you know, they'll find their way to the global microphone and, uh, and share their story and, and learn to have a ripper of a good time. If you hang out with some Aussies or some South Africans, you'd be guaranteed a good time. <laughs> <laughs>
And, and I really, like, I realized like at that point I was thin, I'd lost weight. I was actually really like, I was kind of jacked at the time. I was, I was lifting weights. Like I was in great shape. And, uh, so I felt, I think I felt comfortable and safe to bring this up. And, uh, you know, I realized like, since I was a little kid, every time I ate in front of him, he's eating like this, like looking over at me hmm. instead of looking hmm. at his plate. And he would, you know, you don't need that another role, you know, whatever it was, like wow. he always had a comment for it. And it's not that he was wrong. Uh, the mm-hmm. delivery wasn't great. That wasn't the way to do it. He didn't know any better. And that's, you know, that's what he was raised with. So he thought that's the appropriate thing. And he had all of his fears, you know, medically and, and just from his own experience and how that cost him. But uh, yeah, so when I told him that, he just said, well, that's your problem. Because again, mm-hmm. he didn't, and it, I mean, actually, you know what? As much as I heard at the time, he was spot on. That is 100% my problem. Oh, but that's pretty rough. I didn't, yeah, I didn't like it. <laughs> so, but, but you know, like, I, you can almost feel for the guy on some level because he, he, he had obviously been hurt being overweight himself and yeah. he so badly didn't want you to, to go through that, that the only way he knew how was to try and control you. Yeah. And uh, like, I almost kind of get that. And he doesn't know any other way than just like constantly like telling you, what are you doing? Oh, another role. Maybe that will yeah. work. Maybe if yeah. I just tell him one more time, he'll stop eating, you know? Yeah. And he was desperate. And, um, and again, like that's, that's what he knew. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't fault my father whatsoever. I certainly didn't get it at the time, but it was, my father. it was not his. Totally, um, man. And of course, like, so I say he watched me all the time. I you know, yeah, he made those comments. I'm not making that up, but I don't know that he was actually watching me. I certainly felt that way, yeah. but, um, you know, it's, it's like that song. You're so vain. You probably think the song is about you. Like <laughs> who knows what he's looking at? What the world is not watching you. The yeah. world's comments are not about you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if I say, wow, what a nice car. It's not, that's not me secretly saying your car is a piece of junk. I'm actually like, yes. I'm talking about this one over here, not yours. <laughs> yeah. um, but a lot of us take things that way. But totally. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's no different with my dad and, and I took it that way, but that is on me. And little did I know I was sitting on all this anxiety and all this self judgment. And so his words were really, that just hit me, um, yeah. to look Deep. back at myself and I wasn't ready for it. Yeah. Well, we, Gareth and I actually have talked about it quite a lot of late. It's just like assumption, isn't it? It's just such a bad thing to have. Like you are almost always wrong about what someone else is thinking. So yeah, don't even try, you know, like yeah. you just literally don't even know. So, and generally it's going to be a negative thought. So it's just a good reminder. So thanks yeah. for that. So in, in, in high school, you actually met a quite a great mentor and um, he was a yeah. PE teacher who helped you sort of turn things around. Is that right? Yeah, I am. Um, I actually just drove by my high school uh, Saturday and I said to my son, I was like, you know, that's where Mr. Andre works. I owe him my life. And my wife was like, really? I was like, yeah. And probably our sons as well. Um, he just, he took a really different tact about wellness and I'm incredibly close with him to this day. Uh, you know, I, I talk about him in my book, like he's, I really do owe him so much and is not just my fitness. Uh, he set me he kicked me into a course in a really kind way that I, like, I just wouldn't be here without that. Um, that's when I started to learn more about myself and started to be willing to do that. So he, it was the first time exercise wasn't, Hey fat kid, what's wrong with you? Why are you wheezing? Why can't you go, you know, all the negative stuff. Why are you eating this? It's like, what do you enjoy doing? And it's like, well, everyone makes me run. And I hate it. My knees hurt. It's like, okay, well, we don't have to. Only he has a French accent, so he sounds a lot, <laughs> a lot cooler saying it. But he's like, you don't have to run. He's like, have you ever tried a rowing machine? Have you ever tried an, uh, you know, ellipticals that weren't invented yet, but like a Nordic skier? Or like, what? Have you ever lifted weights? And I was like, oh, I'm a boy in high school. I would love to lift weights. That sounds really <laughs> cool. Get get muscles. Um, so he just helped me kind of explore for myself, what I enjoyed. And he built it in a way that like, you'd see wins, he would set you up for how to track it. This is where I learned a lot of the fundamentals of, of physical fitness, like, create some goals, create some methodologies to track your performance, you know, start with a baseline and then then build something that's going to push you, but you can achieve track yourself how you're doing it. And he was so quick to like, he'd pick up your chart and be like, Wow, man, that's incredible. Look how you did this. <laughs> he pointed, like, it doesn't matter what it was. Even if it was like you did poorly, he's like, you know, I noticed you seem to be dragging, but you still did all this. He's like, and I'm sitting here like, oh, man, I only got half of what I thought. He's like, no, look at this. You know, you had a test this morning. Like, he recognized there is a win in every interaction 
interpretation. And it's not, it doesn't have to be fake. You know, people are like, oh, you failed. Why are you celebrating? It's like, well, mm -hmm. okay, maybe you didn't get where you were going, but that doesn't mean you got nowhere. Mm -hmm. Even if you move backwards, did you learn something in the process? Did you recognize, you know what, your body was not ready for that or your mind wasn't ready for that. And what you learned is you do need to step back. And there's value in that because you're not building this life of like extremes. You're trying to build something sustainable. And he planted all of those seeds in a way that I actually felt like I was building the journey myself because I was and a way that let me explore putting something together I enjoyed. And that's the first time I really realized exercise, you know, everyone jokes about it being like, oh, I got to go to the gym. And like, it's a negative thing for a lot of people. Um, do you honestly expect to keep doing it then? Yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah, like a yeah, job doesn't have to be work in the net. Like, well, it wouldn't be called work if it was enjoyable. Well, maybe it can be. Yeah, true. Mm. You know, like you can't, there are a gazillion things you can do in the gym or for a career. If you explore, you might find something you genuinely love doing that you want to keep doing. Yeah, absolutely. That's how you sustain. Yeah. Exactly. But, yeah. So, so, um, Let's, let's talk about uh, your latest book, uh, Foresight, um, was sparked by a question which you often get after your talks, what do I do uh, for my kids? And uh, so what do people do for their kids uh, in the future, which, have, which awaits all of us and, and them? And what is your mission with this new book? Yeah, so you know, you know, every time I finish a book, I mean, every time I finish a talk, there's obviously parents in the audience, and the parents in the audience often say to me, "I wish my kid was here, so he could have heard, or she could have heard what you just said." So, what should we do for them? Because I'm worried. I don't know that you know, I'm paying incredibly high school fees or incredibly ridiculous university fees for something in preparation that we know is not going to be available or not even necessarily uh, relevant, and so. That question kept coming up and, and I found myself answering it more and more in the fact of it's not what you answer. I mean, it's not what you study. It's how you behave. Because what in the past used to be necessary for us was this linear process of study this to do this. But where we move from this industrial life or world into a quantum world, it starts becoming really important for us to be flexible, adaptable, optimistic, and to be able to move between multiple sectors of thinking. And so it's not so much what you must study, but how you must behave. And the more I thought about this, it's almost like what adults need to be doing is like adults are panicking because they're like, should I be studying artificial intelligence? Should I be doing more blockchain? How am I saying, I don't know, I'm panicking. I'm panicking. I'm like, that's not what you should be focusing on. You should be focusing on how do you become a natural adaptive person? How do you let go of your past? How do you become curious about the world you're living in so that you allow a different energy to drive your behaviors. And the linear world was very much based on scarcity. You know, we've, we've got a lot of scarcity in the system, like credit cards, um, overdrafts, marketing, all these things are scarcity driven. And so we're moving into an abundant world and the quantum world. And we need to change the way we behave. We need to change what makes us most, um, what we define as success. And this all becomes obvious when you start doing the work. Um, of cultivating wisdom and awakening curiosity within your being, you become a natural optimist, a natural flexible person, a natural adaptive human being. And then now you can start maneuvering into a world that is allowing you to be multifaceted. In fact, it gifts you for being multifaceted instead of linear. So the book was driven about this desire to get people to understand of not so much the destination, but the behavior. And when you realize that the behavior is really the most important thing, you stop measuring bullshit numbers and it just becomes irrelevant. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, man. But it's a, it's an amazing book, uh, by the way. So, so thanks so much for sharing it uh, with us, like, like Craig said, and, uh, but uh, you have this amazing way of writing and also putting a book together. And I just kind of love the techniques of how you explain things as well. Um, it really makes it engaging and like very easy to read, which is, I guess, super important. Um, so you talk about uh, four different types of seeing in the book. Yeah, uh, yeah. Foresight, plain sight, insight. Uh, sorry, hindsight, plain sight, insight, and foresight. So yeah. maybe you can just uh, explain us sure. what that actually means. So hindsight was very much uh, a result of working with Dojo, the Dr. Joe Dispenza. 
And uh, he speaks about this a lot is, are you living a life based on a set of memories from your past? Or are you living a life based on the vision of your future? Which is such a powerful statement. And that really got me to think about how so many people in the world are stuck in their past, are creating their now based on their memories and their perspectives of where they come from. And so what we've got to do is realize that the past isn't the way we need to create our future because the more predictable our past, uh, the more familiar our past is, the more predictable our future becomes. And the future doesn't require predictability. It requires brand newness, you know? So that's hindsight. It's like, just let's become aware that hindsight doesn't work. Uh, then we get plain sight. So the people that are the logical thinkers of the world, the people that only believe what their five senses tell them. And so if I can see it, feel it, taste it, touch it, it's real. Um, I need to see it before I can believe it. And we've started to realize that's such an old story because now with quantum science, again, Joe Dispenza, um, biology of belief with Bruce Lipton, it's really believing as seeing, not seeing as believing. It's like, we've got to take responsibility for the identity we create, the stories we tell about ourselves and what drives our motivation. But people that are stuck in plain sight are cynics. They're total cynics about the rest of this crap. They don't want to believe any of it. They're so stuck in their stories of the past and where they are right now. And they're really quite clearly victims and pessimists about what's going on. And then we get people that are stuck in insight. And I think insight's actually the biggest problem we have. Because people who are stuck in insight have got incredibly high levels of knowledge. They have got the PhDs, the masters, the MBAs. They've got all the correct thinking formulation. And these people have also been called the expert problem people, is that they are so expert in a way of thinking, that it's very difficult for them to change their behavior or to take any information in that doesn't fit into the same constructs of how they've learned how to think about things. And so what happens is they are highly knowledgeable, but have zero wisdom because wisdom is practice knowledge. And so what happens is because they're academically rich, they believe that because they've done all that work, they deserve success. And the fact that mm -hmm. the success in the future doesn't look like what it used to, they're perturbed by this. And so that's, that's insight, highly knowledgeable, no wisdom. And so foresight is really getting us to a point where we can uh, cultivate wisdom and awaken curiosity. In other words, heal our past. As Alan Watts says, the, the knowledgeable man learns something new every day. The wise man unlearns something new every day. Mm. Uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza calls it having memories with no wisdom, um, having memories with no triggers. That's wisdom. Uh, mm. Tony Robbins calls it going from unconscious memories to conscious memories, from blaming your past to thanking your past. Mm. Or, all these teachers have got different languages, but that's what wisdom is. Wisdom is being Zen, not allowing your past to trigger you. And then curiosity just really is about making decisions with what makes you most excited, not what's logical and lo also not what's ego driven because logic in the future is not going to get us into the future. The world's not logical. It's not familiar. It's not linear. So when you combine wisdom and curiosity, you've let go of who you were. You are now focused on building the future based on an energy that's excitement that gives you the opportunity to be enthusiastic, innovative, creative, and adaptive because you just flow with this process because nothing's hinged on your back and now you've got this endless energy that you can access. Hmm. So, so, I mean, that's, that's all, it's pretty fascinating. Now the, the inside, right. I just want to just take a moment back there. You, you were saying that's kind of the dangerous one. And is that kind of that, that person that you were speaking about just before we got on the show that, you know, every now and then there'll be someone that just doesn't agree with what you're saying on stage. It's like, it happens every now and again. And is it that person usually that that's stuck in insight, that's knowledgeable, but they, but they just, they think they know it all, but they feel resented, resentful because they're hearing that things have to change. And just yeah, before, and just before you, sorry, just before you answer the question, um, are, are the people in insight, do you feel that they maybe lack a bit of emotional intelligence? Is, is that also part of it? Absolutely. They focus everything on their heads, not heart. They disconnected mm -hmm. their hearts and they become intellectually um, uh, knowledgeable. And you can tell when people these days are, are intellectually aware, but emotionally asleep. And so they, they've got all the processes and systems and they've analyzed everything and it's detailed and it's so, and they're, they've been so successful and they were so clever before artificial intelligence arrived. 
But now you have artificial intelligence that does it quicker, faster, cheaper than them than they could ever do because what education taught us was how to think linearly. Because that's what the industrial revolution demanded of us. And so now what's happened is that education system is based on the left brain thinking and that is being disrupted. So mm. of course it's difficult. Of course. Of course it's difficult to say, you know, I've had all these privileges because of my degrees and PhDs and now all of a sudden they don't give me that huge step up based on all the hard work that I've done. So of course it's, it's, it's horrible. And you know, I never had that. So I'm, I'm cool. I'm lucky that my brain is wired naturally for this. I was super cuck at school. I, I was just useless. I, I, my brain doesn't think like that. And so I was never wired for that. So it's just that people that were wired like that and forced themselves to be that good now are, dis are being disrupted and are miserable about the process that it's going on. And, and they can't now want to awaken curiosity. And uh, I mean, you get like these old white men in the audience like, what shit are you talking about? What do you mean awaken curiosity? It's like so flowery. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, can, you can call it what you want. You can diss it as much as you want. But as we start moving into the future, adaptability becomes a superpower. Linear mm -hmm. thinking becomes a suicide. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, snowy cape fold, mountain range. Gotta be quick, so.